In this episode, I host part three of a dialogue between Shinzen Yang, meditation teacher and neuroscience research consultant, and Chelsea Fasano, a neuroscience student at Columbia University. In this episode, we discuss experiences of oneness versus experience of emptiness in meditation, gamma brain activity and binding, Posner's model of attentional networks, and more. Chelsea explores the surprising similarities between mystical experience, epilepsy, and orgasm, while Shinzen reveals the profound challenges of integrating esoteric states into practical life. So without further ado, Shinzen Young and Chelsea Fasano. Shinzen Young and Chelsea Fasano, welcome back to the Shinzen and Chelsea, po- I mean the Guru Viking podcast. Well, the new management will uh, equip ourselves well. In the last installment of this uh, series of episodes, we joke that you guys are taking over around here, a sort of coup d'etat, a paradigmatic uh, triumph of science over savage, I think. We could characterize it. <laughs> so we'll see. Uh, so in the first uh, conversation, uh, this is the third uh, in the series, we got deep into the thorny problem of definitions. And in the second, we began to explore the science. And I have a feeling that there's more where that came from here. And Chelsea, I understand you've completed now the first draft of your literature review. Congratulations. Yes, very exciting. Um, and I've um, run through some of it with Dr. Sanguinetti, your colleague, Shenzhen, and um, I've uh, compiled a lot of the sort of raw data that's out there on these topics we've been discussing. And what I'm actually trying to do right now is start a second draft. And the goal for my second draft is I'm trying to develop a model for the process of change that happens through contemplative practice that is based on elements that are quantifiable according to hard science. So I'm trying to sort of take the data I collected and make a sort of structure out of it that might be something we could use to measure um, stages of practice or the arc of practice. And as you said in our last meeting um, that we had privately, we are sort of on the front lines, if you will, of trying to take these models that have been made by spiritual teachers and see if the elements that they're composed of are in fact quantifiable, measurable things. So it's um, it's a bit philosophical and also scientific at this point. But I have some ideas about what might be happening that I really want to run by you and okay. see if I'm on to the right track here. I get it. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> so this is going to be a bit of a backstory, but I want to give the big question and then the sort of fine print. The big question is, after our last call, I actually had a bit of an epiphany about what you call the zero and the one. So... I think, and I'm, I, I think that it is highly likely that the zero and the one, which I'll get into what those are, according to you and me, <clears throat> are- So we're gonna, we're gonna define <clears throat> those terms at some point. Yes, so right. I think that the zero and the one possibly have different neurological developmental lines. And this is why. As I was looking at the data that's out there on long-term meditators, <clears throat> I found several things that were happening in groups of two. So there were two groups of oscillatory activity. One is in gamma band and one is in theta band. Some uh, meditation studies show a serious increase in gamma band activity and some show a serious increase in theta band activity. The other thing that happens is there's seemingly two levels of processing that you could say are groups. One is global processing and the other is local. So one is a long range type of activity and the other is short range local activity. And the other is simply high versus low activity. And as I was looking at this, the way that I started to begin to think about it is this. We've discussed a lot uh, about this concept of top-down versus bottom-up processing. But obviously top-down processing is a huge construct. And what that consists of is highly debatable and very complex. 
But one of the most primary ways that we do top-down processing, in other words, the way that we construct reality out of our sensory experience is through oscillatory activity. And one of the big unsolved, um, well, partially unsolved mysteries in neuroscience is the, the binding problem. And the question is, how do we, in fact, make one coherent percept out of the various sensory processing centers that happen in areas of the brain that are seemingly not connected? And the answer that people think is oscillatory activity, that these synchronous oscillatory patterns are binding together disparate elements into one coherent percept. So it follows, in my mind, that in, in these situations where you're seeing high uh, gamma band long range activity, as well as a uh, decrease in anti-correlation between networks that are normally anti-correlated. So normally this, these networks are firing and these networks are firing. But then in long-term meditators, we see that they all start firing together. Basically there's this increase in synchrony and a volume of synchrony. So what that might subjectively look like is everything is becoming one. All the things I'm seeing, not just my five senses, but in fact, other people, and normally things that are perceived as separate, everything would be cohering. Now, the other thing I saw was this decrease in activity and this emphasis on local processing. And so you could imagine that what might be happening in those situations is actually the opposite, that perceptions that are normally cohered would be decohering and dissolving. And that as you zoned in on these more early or deep levels of processing, as you called them on our last call, you would begin to have the experience of things that used to be perceived as a whole suddenly fracturing into parts. And so Based on this scientific data, plus uh, subjective experiences of myself and other meditators, plus conversations with you, I began to think that it's possible <laughs> that people are developing along the lines of these two vectors. And I wanted to see if you think that's a possibility. Or if you yes. think, yes. So tell me more about why you use the term the zero and the one and what those refer to here. Well, so <clears throat> I've noticed that in the literature that I've read about, you know, the sort of phenomenology of what people experience in meditation, as well as having my own subjective experience and sort of collecting the subjective experience of many other people that I've talked to over de a decade and a half of doing this, and also looking at the you know more contemporary work on this uh the experiences people are having it seems to be that there are these two separate experiences or at least they're often perceived separate initially so in in my conception right now and this is what i need your help on there's the one is the experience that people have where if everything coheres into one whole, one unending whole, and you lose yourself in the sense that you lose yourself as a discrete object in this one unending whole, which is kind of everything all at once. And then there seems to be a different pathway, which is more about emptiness rather than fullness, and is more about dissolution rather than integration and seems to involve the pulling apart of phenomena into more and more smaller elements. So th th I, because I know that this subjective experience occurs, and then I looked at the neuro data, and to me, it seems like pulling apart and coming together were happening differently neurologically and subjectively. Does that answer the question? <clears throat> Well, it clarifies. Um, <clears throat> this is a very murky area. Mm -hmm. We're not, uh, I don't have any 
magic thing to say here. So, uh, whereas sometimes I sort of do, you know, it's like, yeah, <laughs> I've been asked that question 200 times. So, but right. this, uh, this is nothing pops out. Uh, oh, I know exactly what we need to be saying here. So let's sort of tease out the strands a little bit more right. and uh, see what happens. Mm -hmm. uh, I, the first question for me is, is <clears throat> that something you perceive in your students, that there are those two lines of development? Is that a theme that you notice? If you ask, have I <clears throat> spoken in that language with students and <clears throat> was that uh, something I would considered to be significant, I would answer yes. So I have used that kind of language, mm -hmm. but <clears throat> not, um, not quite the same way you're using it. Mm -hmm. Because uh, <clears throat> the, um, for me, they seem to be part of the same process. Mm -hmm. They're actually one process. So <clears throat> here would be the um, an example of because uh, we're just comparing l language. You asked, "Have I ever spoken that way?" Yes. Was it significant? Yes. How that maps on to the science we're hoping to create—that's a whole other question. But that language, yes, uh, and significantly so. So. Let's take it back to your own experience. <clears throat> You've probably had the experience of um, uh, having a physical discomfort of some sort. <clears throat> could be just an itch, you know, or it's too hot, too cold, or it could be like actual pain. Uh, you've probably had the experience of focusing on that until it sort of wasn't an issue for you anymore. Is that correct? Most people with the practice, if they've you know, done it for a few years, they, they've had that kind of experience. <clears throat> and certainly that was an important thing for me early on uh, because I was in Japan, it was old school samurai boot camp, and I'm basically a wimp. Uh, and it's like, what am I doing here, <laughs> you know, expo uh, exposing myself to this kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> but uh, there I was, and you, you had to just sit there, you couldn't move, and it got very, very uncomfortable. So <clears throat> when I discovered that pain could, or broadly physical discomfort could quote, break up, <clears throat> that you didn't actually have to relieve it by getting rid of it, there was an alternative route. For someone whose early life was unusually preoccupied with having to be comfortable at all times, I wasn't just so narcissistic and self-indulgent, I was unusually so. so this was a huge discovery. Now, what it felt like to me over the years as I was learning how to do this with progressively more challenging types of uh, sensations, the languaging that I would use is, um, at first, <clears throat> it seems just like a jagged, solid thing. And it's just a rock sitting there. That's your first perception. Then it becomes not quite that solid. There's some subtle indication that it might shift a little here, vibrate a little there. It's not absolutely solid. Now that <clears throat> perception that it's sort of beginning to wobble and shift and maybe scintillate a little bit, what have you, to me, <clears throat> that felt like a certain pattern that, the, that 
my nervous system was trying to make was now being allowed to happen. So, <clears throat> and what that pattern was, <clears throat> was the actual pain itself, as opposed to what? That rock, which is the pain as normally perceived, not just by me, but by anyone. It was just this rock solid thing. So my perception was, <clears throat> What's really there is not this rock solid thing, even though that's what I and everyone else experience normally. What's really under there is an, excuse me, Tucson, dry and it's winter. So I have to have the heat on. Um, so the, um, a certain activity that was frozen is now, thawing a little bit. Oh, well, if that's all it wants to do, then let's let it do that a little more. And it becomes more. Now, as it's doing that, on one hand, you could say it's becoming more fluid. Uh, you could make a metaphor with a phase shift uh, in a physical system going from solid to softening to fluid, uh, you know, liquid. Um, <clears throat> okay, so, but it also seemed to me that in addition to it's becoming more fluid, it's also doing what it wants to do now, and that's why it's causing me less suffering. In addition to that, um, it's becoming integrated. There's an activity that wants to just integrate. It wants to become one thing. And it is becoming integrated. Um, so I had the sense it's fluidifying. Yes, but really it's now being allowed to ex just express itself. And another way to think of it is it feels more integrated. It's, it's less jagged. It becomes this, this smooth thing. Then what happens is that becomes dramatically more so. So now the perception, oh, it's finally doing what it wants to do. And the perception, this is one thing, are getting more and more stronger. So there's an integration that is happening. However, um, it's becoming thinner and more spacious because the fluidity of it, I believe, is a, my guess, is also associated with more efficient information processing. That would be my guess, that there's an efficiency thing going on. So it's a whole bunch of things at once. It's fluid, it's integrating, it's what my nervous system wants to do if something else weren't in some way interfering with it, or some other part of it weren't interfering. This is all it wants to do. And if it just does that, it, hardly hurts at all, even though it could be convulsive levels of intensity. So, but at the same time, well, <clears throat> it's sort of becoming thinner and lighter. Um, and then when that reaches a certain limit, you have this experience of it's there, but it's not there. Um, it's like a, like a phantom, vivid, but without substance. And you can learn this with small pieces of experience so that the, um, the, the unification and the 
what would be the word? Nullification? <laughs> are part of the same process. And my guess is that it is um, associated with, it goes back to what you're saying about the, okay, there's a flow that goes up. There's a flow that goes down. We know that. And those flows cross each other. There's something about how those flows cross that is slightly um, less um, evolved than it could be. And that causes, it's very subtle, but because it's pervasive, um, just something about this interaction. And of course, it's happening all the time in all the senses at all scales. It's going, it's going this way, it's going that way. Something about this interaction, if you think about it, it's sort of miraculous, right? I mean, can you, um, you know about integrated information theory. Can, can, how do we even wrap our heads around quantifying with bits and bytes using Shannon entropy? Uh, I mean, Shannon information theory. Uh, how do we even quantify that dance? Oh my God, what's going on there? How many wires are there? And is it, is it even the wires that are doing it? Is it something else? Is it at the quantum level? Anyway, the one thing we know is it's going like this. And my sense is it took 2 billion years to figure out quite how to do that. So we shouldn't be surprised if it's not quite perfectly efficient. And um, I experienced it at one time in my life as there's a thing called a self and a thing called a world. Now that they seem to interpenetrate without interfering more, more <clears throat> there's an activity called self, an activity called world, and they're one activity. It's true. Uh, that's the way I would describe it. <laughs> but what we're trying to figure out now is how does that relate to what we know about the nervous system? And that's that is that's a stretch. So <clears throat> let's, so I just, you, you asked me, because we're talking about language, have I ever used integration and annihilation as themes in my teaching? Absolutely. But it wasn't to say there's two sides to the practice. Mm -hmm. It's to have people look at the process I'm describing in terms of flow causes integration. See, if you get one part of your body to be fluid, that's sort of integrated, but it also sort of thins out. If you get your whole body to be fluid, it's even more integrated, but it's also thinned out. You include your mind in that, now your whole sense of self is unfixated. And then you include sight sound, now self and world are dancing one dance. Um, Can I ask one question, Shinsen? Yeah. So it seems like um, what you're saying is that integration and dissolution are a part of the same process and that they- Well, as I was using the words, right. and that may not be as you are using the words. That's why I'm trying to be careful here. I think because I you and I are, working on a harder problem, <laughs> a lot harder problem. Well, first I'm trying to solve whether or not, because I think we, in my mind at least, I would like to do this neurophenomenologically. So I'm trying to solve to a certain extent the phenomenological part, which I think you're the best person to, to do with because you have such vast experience of experience, uh, hearing all of these phenomenological reports. And then to see if these, uh, aspects of the phenomenology are quantifiable. Um, but my, so my question, I guess, on that uh, 
pertaining to that is, do you experience um, every one of your students as developing these sort of integration and dissolution components simultaneously? Or do you experience that some develop on one front more and then the other one comes along? Um, or so basically, do they seem separable to you? Um, because the, the way I was thinking about it in my head is almost like lines of development and integration between dissolution and uh, integration, like integrating integration and dissolution would be kind of a third vector. So there's like the two lines and then there's the degree to which they've integrated. Um, but so I'm curious if you have experienced them developing differently in your students or always together. Always together, but that's the way I approach it. So that's what I'm looking for. And also that's what they're likely to find because that's the underlying assumption. So they all, yes, but once again, that is within the context of a certain kind of teaching. And as you know, that's the problem because you teach a certain way and it implies things to students and then they have certain experiences and it's an artifact of the way you taught. And then now, but we're trying to find what's universal. So that's where you get tricky. Let's go back to what we know uh, on the uh, biophysical level, because we started the conversation there. And uh, perhaps it would be helpful to go back. You made several um, contrasts, binary contrasts. And binary contrasts are always good. Um, Gamma, which if people don't know, is relatively high frequency versus theta, which is relatively low frequency. You had that distinction. You also talked about long range, which would imply a, uh, a duality of short range. When you use the phrase local versus global, was that synonymous with long, uh, short range versus long range, or was that a, a different language? Yes. So yeah, so it seems like there's somewhere, you know, if you're measuring with an EEG cap, you're getting oscillatory activity, you know, maybe here and here, whereas some you're getting oscillatory activity just in very local areas like here, right? Um, and so the long range activity has certain sort of connotations of what it could produce versus versus short range. So yeah. So are, I, I just want to clarify, are we talking about both gamma and theta as, are we talking about a binding happening just with gamma or? I think gamma has been the most studied as a, uh, as the wavelength that is responsible for binding. There's a lot of literature about how gamma in specific is, is very good at binding things together because of something about its specific wavelength. Um, my colleague that I'm actually working with on the second draft knows more about this than me, but I think um, that was what I was thinking when I looked at the data. And to be clear, a lot of these studies are because they're not done neurophenomenologically in large part, and they are, what you end up with is a picture of numbers in a sense. And, and sometimes there's not a ton of description, description to go along. It just says, you know, long-term meditator. What that means and what they're experiencing is kind of up, yeah, yeah. up for grabs. Up for grabs. So you end up with like a picture of numbers that then it's almost like what I'm trying to do is look into that yeah, 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 make yeah. What a, you're trying to do is real science. Make a, a name make for it. <laughs> right. There's I a mean, name for what you're trying to do. It's called real science. Well, I mean, there but are. It's a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm trying to see something in this. You know, I'm trying to see experiences in numbers and see what this could mean for people because you get data. But then it doesn't necessarily say, well, this is exactly what the meditator was experiencing. So I'm inferring from the data a possible experience based on what I know about the data. Yeah. So it's tricky. But 
you'll be that meditator master eventually, and then you'll know, okay? You have that to look forward to. <laughs> and so does the world. But for now, let's talk about gamma. So tell me a little bit more about gamma and binding as you understand it, and particularly how that would re relate to long range uh, or global versus short range or local. Um, give me a little bit more information, uh, gamma where, under what circumstances, mm -hmm. you know, doing what sorts of binding. So we can start to make that picture. I can get a clearer sense of how you're envisaging that story. Right. So the way I'm thinking of the story is gamma has been talked about as the wavelength that people experience, for instance, when you bite into an apple and in that moment you have, a, most people who have not meditated for a long time will have a brief burst of gamma activity where they're experiencing the taste of the apple, the smell of the apple, the sight of the apple, the, and, and it all comes together in this moment of cohesion where these things are one with each other in, in a heightened manner. Also, we actually see- And that gamma tip that you're thinking of in this instance would be occurring where? In well, the brain. right. You know, I have not gone into extremely detailed um, ex uh, exploration of the exact locations of, you know, the uh, the activity. Are there some general sense? Does it, you know, which right. lobe? <laughs> right, right, right. Well, I think so. What they've, what they've, what they're saying in a lot of these studies is simply just massive increase right when they're looking at because what they do is they study meditation in a block so as they're studying it they're basically comparing like this entire block of a meditator's brain with a non-meditator's brain which again is it's not so precise but they're what they're so what they're saying broadly is lots more gamma all the time rather than brief short bursts of gamma in these very specific moments which is what people are experiencing who are not long-term meditators Oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, uh, a little too fast. Um, could you go over that again, please? It was a little too fast. Yes. So a lot of these results that I'm looking at are basically a compilation of a kind of block of meditation. So it's not that they're tracking the activity specifically as the meditation progresses, as I think actually you and Dr. Sanguinetti are doing. It's more that they're looking at averages kind of. of and they're comparing it to normals. And they're comparing yeah. it is to that, Is most of the literature of that form that you found? A lot of it, yes. There is some really amazing work by this researcher, Berkovich Ohana, who does this extremely detailed work where she interviews the meditator about their experiences while she puts them through EEG and fMRI. And then she correlates their reports in the moment with exactly what's happening. But that is not most of the literature. Most of it is yeah. designs. And so- How do you spell her name? B-E-R-K-O-V-I-C-H dash O-H-A-N-A. Uh, I really love her her and her colleagues, um, which I think are working out of Israel, actually. And I, I just love their work. And they work with um, long-term meditators who have ex really uh, agency over entering these states of consciousness volitionally. And so they can go into a state and then track what's happening in there while they're in the fMRI, which to me is amazing. I, I could never do this. Uh, and so they're able to track moment by moment these subtle changes in subjective by objective. But the bulk of the research is more like we saw a big increase in gamma activity over the course of this 90 minute meditation right. compared to a control. And then from there, I'm trying to think, what could this mean? Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. It does. It gives me a clearer picture. So let me say it back to you in my words. <clears throat> so 
you've been looking into the literature that compares meditators with non-meditators, <clears throat> and most of it uses a, methodo a methodology that involves having meditators meditate <laughs> during a block and having non-meditators do whatever the control is. And then you see a general pattern. There's more in general, probably everywhere, but in general, you see statistically significantly more gamma in meditators, probably across traditions, I'm guessing. Uh, so it's an average of an average, really. <laughs> uh, it doesn't give you uh, a lot of precision, but it tells us something. Your hypothesis is that the fact that on average more gamma is shown during in meditators during these blocks, that that would indicate that while they're doing these techniques, there's more uh, binding occurring on average during that period of time. Is that the, did I correctly reflect back to you, the, your thinking? Yes. Okay, so we've been talking in this field about gamma for a long, long time and binding for a long, long time. Uh, do you, would you say that other researchers uh, come to the same conclusion or do they, have they come to other conclusions just with respect to this data that you're reporting? About? Uh... About the, the uh, fact that the meditators may be binding better uh, <laughs> because well... they're more gamma-ish. I, I, so I ran this by Dr. Sanguinetti. He read my entire review and his, his broad comment was that most of what I was, the direction I was going was very uh, similar to the way he thinks about things in the lab. I don't want to give, you know, his endorsement for every single thought that I emit on this podcast. Wow, but, but that's great because he's, he's a tough character, you know, I mean, he's, he's, yeah. he's really done his homework. He's, he's very nice to me. I don't think of him as a tough guy. Oh, character. no, I don't mean tough that way. I mean, intellectually, you know. Oh, yeah. I mean, he said it, it, it generally seemed like the, the, the right direction. Uh, so I assume that if there was something glaringly wrong about my interpretations, he would have let me know. Um, and um, so I have that to, uh, to say. And I, I think, you know, some of Richard Davidson's lab has... has uh, kind of put forth similar thoughts about, uh, you know, why we see such huge increases in gamma, especially in, you know, really, really uh, accomplished meditators uh, seeming to have just high resting gamma that even when not meditating, it's just way, way more gamma activity. And so I've heard them kind of use these, these same ideas to infer what the subjective experience uh, may be. Okay. So since we're doing real science here, <laughs> let's try to hypothesize why, why gamma would have binding effects, number one, and number two, why um, uh, would Though, uh, uh, how would those binding effects function? How would it actually come about? Now, isn't it true that, okay, so you have a frequency it's sinusoidal. Um, let's say it's at 40 hertz, which is about the gamma range uh, or center of gamma. So, you know, it's pretty fast. <laughs> um, how, 
how does that, how would, and then you have different regions of the brain are gonna be doing different things. How does this frequency create correlation among parts of the brain? Is it, you know, where's the causality? Is the frequency coming from what the parts are doing? Is the frequency creating what the parts are doing? Is it a little of both? Um, yeah. And is it, uh, does it happen on the upswing of the gamma wave, the downswing? I think the binding always happens at the same phase. Yeah. Uh, etc. But I could, this is a little out of my area, you're studying it. Let's you and I try to figure out why. Uh, I think there's two questions. One is why that frequency, mm -hmm. which you said there's some hypothesis about that. Uh, I don't have any idea. But I think you and I could try to figure out what the binding is. How does that, or right. you, perhaps you have seen what other people have said about this and you can tell me because it's out of my area a little bit. So there's some things that I know about this, some things that I don't know, some things that the field knows and some things that the field doesn't know. Um, I was just talking about this with my friend, uh, Kenneth Shinazuka, who is working with me on the project now. And he recommended that I read this book uh, by Georgi Busaki, The Rhythms of the Brain, apparently he goes into great detail about what exactly each frequency is doing and how. A lot of this is things I have not particularly looked at, um, but I do know that there's something about that, that frequency of, of gamma that specifically seems to be able to do something when it goes back and forth between different neural areas, areas of neurons. Uh, however, what I do know is that from um, my reading of literature about attention, what happens or what is being observed to happen in attention is that we, there's a network of areas that are responsible for attention, but obviously attention to what is the question. So what they've observed is that when, for instance, someone is directed to pay attention to a specific visual stimuli, the attentional networks begin to oscillate exactly at the same time as the visual area, uh, the visual processing area. So you get this synchronous activity that's either bouncing back and forth or it's going exactly at the same rate. And as far as I know, it's actually a bit of a mystery what's going on there. And there's- oh, Okay, can, can we actually pause at this point? Because uh, I want to make sure I've followed. I'm going to begin losing the train. Okay. Um, so there are, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, uh, some specific things the field knows about gamma and binding. Um, one of them is <clears throat> that when you are given a visual task, and I'm assuming this is see out an external visual because we can also have see in visual tasks. Um, so I'm assuming you're being given an out, but probably the same is true for in visual task. Um, the primary visual areas and probably all the other ones light up because um, you're doing something visual. But at the same time, the general attentional networks light up. And if I got this right, they tend to either be in phase or is is it one activates while the other rests? It would be 
like this area of the brain is bouncing a signal over here and then bouncing it back like this. And it looks like they're communicating like this to each other in, when you look at it. Or they like go there's... together at the same time. But what they're so, saying is- So they seem to be going either this way or, wait a minute, if you're bouncing- like bouncing the neural signal. So this one sends it, this one receives it like this. Send, receive, right. Send, receive. Versus all together. And that's a general pattern. What do they call that in the literature? Synchronous oscillatory activity. Yeah, synchronous, I understand. But uh, the distinction between um, we're hitting the ball at the same time versus we're throwing the ball back and forth. What do right. they call that distinction? I don't know. And honestly, Shinzen, you're getting so deep and I'm so impressed. I just kind of said synchronous oscillatory activity and left it at that because there's so much that's a mystery about oscillatory activity that I kind of am not getting too deep into it. I, I need to get deeper, but you need to. And I and so do I. I, I don't yeah. know this stuff. That's but why I'm asking you. The thing is, there's it's kind of a mystery, is part of it. Because as far as well, let's see if we can solve the mystery. You, right want to solve the, you want to solve the mystery of oscillatory activity? Wow, that's way beyond me, Shinsen. But this is what I'm going to say. There is this idea that every single electrical impulse that passes through the brain should be supposedly connected by neurons that are adjacent, right? You know, it's going between here's one neuron, here's another, there's a synapse, electricity is passing through. So there's huge swaths of neuroscientists that just feel very confused about how it is that this attentional area, which is nowhere near the visual cortex, is somehow seems to be recruiting the visual cortex from far away, but there's no actual uh, structural connectivity, which is why there's this big distinction in neuroscience between structural and functional connectivity. And what is functional connectivity, as far as I know, is very debated. So when I find a thing that really high level neuroscientists are debating and don't understand, I just sort of avoid it because I don't feel qualified to even put my voice into a dialogue that is so advanced. I just am thinking- Well, well let's, <laughs> yeah, let's, let's, Let's see what we can do, okay? We see what we can do with the information we're given. So let me just confirm the synchronous activity, at least in your reading, <clears throat> tends to take one of two forms. You're either in phase, which, uh, uh, or if it looks like you're passing a ball, what does that look like? Do, does yeah. this move and then this moves a minute? Are they, exactly. how, what's that like? If you look at an animation of it, it often looks like there's this sort of bouncing, act, neural activity bouncing around the brain. Like it's, da -da -da -da, but it goes in the same pattern over and over. So it seems like there's a reason why it's going like that, right? And you see these sort of symphonies happening of how it's sort of seemingly, if you look at it visually, it looks like it's being bounced from area to area, either back and forth or among several areas. Um, and then if you do the same task and you look at this in an fMRI, you can actually see this pattern occurring, right? And so most of what I know about this is from attention and perception where you see the perceptual area and the attentional networks oscillating together and then what that results in is subjective heightened experience of the sensory area. So when they focus on the visual, they see more visual clarity. When they focus on taste, they have more taste. When they focus on uh, a hearing, they hear it louder. And so it seems that this oscillatory activity is evoking or recruiting sensory processing areas. And that's the main way that I've studied oscillatory activity. As okay, so, so there are these, uh, general attention areas that we know about. Um, and then there are <clears throat> specific sensory modes like visual, auditory, somatic, inner, outer, and so forth. And what you're saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, <clears throat> at least in your reading so far, is that um, if you give a person a visual task, uh, you see visual areas recruited. Um, the general focus areas are also involved. And what's happening is they're both doing gamma. Um, if you give them 
a visual, uh, a uh, somatic or auditory task, different sensory uh, areas light up. The attentional areas are the same areas as before, but now these things are linked with gamma. And um, what's mysterious is that somehow the attentional networks and the individual dedicated processing regions, they, they're, not lo, lo, they're not in proximity to each other. Mm -hmm. So then what's happening? What's happening? And no one really knows. I mean, there's theories, but there's not, I wouldn't say there's a consensus in the field about exactly how is, how are neurons that are so far away communicating in what is obviously a relationship that they're having between this synchronous oscillatory activity. When there's not a lot of known physical connectivity. Exactly. So how is- there is the functional connectivity. You're talking, as, yeah, they're talking, somehow they're talking to each other. We see this rhythm occurring. And when we see the rhythm, it happens that people give this objective report that, well, I paid attention to it and then it got stronger. I could taste it more. You see more neurons firing. And so there's some kind of relationship happening, but the explanation, when you get down to these questions that you're asking, you're asking all the questions I don't have answers to. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I said we're doing real science. <laughs> That's the, you discover, you thought you were doing science in school. <laughs> <laughs> what you were doing was just learning what other people <laughs> had well, figured yeah. out. You know? These are actually the questions that Kenneth was asking me because I presented all of this information to him, basically. I was, you know, I had, okay, a gamma band increase and here's this and da 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 and he, and he basically went, yeah, but okay, what does this mean, right? And I think in a lot of neuroscience, there's, there's a few different paradigms happening. One is sort of, well, we measured the brain and we found that this area lit up. And then we found that this, you know, frequency band happened. And that's sort of it, right? That's the, that's the final conclusion. And that's where I was at with the article. And then Kenneth came along and said, basically, this just isn't enough, which is what you're saying. Like, well, why, right? But the thing is, there's really a lot of people that aren't asking that question. And so I wasn't really asking it. I was sort of content with, well, it seems like there's this frequency band happening. And what do we think about that, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Well, let's, let's think about it right now. Oh. Um, the areas that you are, um, you, you alluded to attentional areas. Yeah. Um, give me, uh, I need to take some names. Okay. Uh, uh, what, well, what, have, uh, Peterson and Posner's work on attentional networks. This is the main model that I was looking at. And they yeah, I'm sorry, uh, I didn't quite hear. Po Poser and what? Peterson and Posner are the two. Peterson? Peterson, yeah, and Posner um, have developed a, a, a uh, model of attention that actually has three different networks. Yes, so I, I have some familiarity. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so you're using, I don't know, it's not the Peterson who's here, is it? Is that, that a woman? No, it's two men. But but they're basically okay. is alerting, orienting, and executive. And alerting is mostly in the brain stem and involves norepinephrine and the sort of basic, you know, awakeness. Orienting is orienting towards the stimuli, and then executive is our sort of volitional control. And the executive network is, you know, prefrontal cortex areas. Um, so it kind of goes. Where, up where is the uh, orienting? Let me figure this out. Let me pull up some Peterson and Posner. Shinzen, you always take things to the deepest level. <laughs> on, it's take me a minute to actually look up Peterson. And Posner. Well, it, actually, it's okay because now I know what you're talking about. I have some familiarity. So, um, for those that may not know what we're talking about, uh, this is the classic study. Um, from the Michael Posner lab of there are these attentional that uh, points out these attentional networks and it's widely used. So now I know what you're talking about. I found it. Orienting. 
The orienting network is focused on the ability to prioritize sensory input by selecting a modality or location. Discussion of the pulvinar and superior colliculus. I mean, these things are so, there's, it, the, the, it's a network and it has so many different um, parts, but it looks like temporoparietal junction, which is an area I know you and Dr. Sanguinetti study, um, frontal eye fields, which are definitely a big, uh, a big attentional area. Um, sorry, I'm reading this paper as talking. Which paper is it? Maybe you could cite it. Also. Peterson and Posner, the attention systems of the human brain 20 years after Stephen E. Peterson and Michael I. Posner. What's the date? Um, 20, 2012. So 2012. Is, yeah, that's that's not too old. That's good. Right. That's well, fairly they recent. Developed it 20 years ago, and then they've done. You know, now it's it's been. I think there's a graph of how many people have cited this paper. It's become very kind of standard uh, standard understanding of how attention works that they developed, and there's there's quite a bit of evidence that looks at this. But um, yeah, I'm going to have to re look at this myself. But this gave me enough context to understand what you meant by the, quote, attentional networks. Um, so let's think about this. First of all, the fact that people re report more vividness when there's binding in this way, that means more information flow, I would say. That, well, there's definitely more electrical activity in the sensory processing areas. Right, but if they're saying things are vivid, right. to me, that would indicate more resolution yeah. and therefore more bits and bytes yes. involved. And I, I, also quite, I don't quite know where the bits and bytes are going, but right. I think there are more of them there. I also did some background research on the sensory clarity idea we discussed, and there was, uh, they did find that with an increase, certain researcher, I think Cliff Saren, they studied people and they found that with an increase in execution of successful uh, tasks in the visual system, there was an increase in occipital areas, a faster and stronger response that, that accompanied the sensory clarity that they measured. So this increase of uh, increase in activity and its covariance with uh, the vividness, there seems to be substantial evidence that those things work together in meditation and in life. Right. So um, that's, that's interesting. So how might this work? we see what seems to be um, a packet sort of moving from here to here to here, Mean, meaning it starts at one time, it ends at another time, and it tends to go in the same pattern. Mm -hmm. And there would be a delay. Uh, so it's sort of like here, 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 here. Does, does it seem from the literature that we're really talking about a zigzag kind of motion one thing sort of going here, then here, then here, ends up here, then the thing ends, and then it starts again. Or is it more diffuse that it goes from here to a couple places <laughs> and then bounces over to a couple other places and then sort of all comes together is it really uh, this kind of thing, or is it more, is it spreading literally along one dimension at once, or might it have a fractal 
nature that it's going out into other dimensions briefly. Uh, and it's more like a, a spread or a Brownian type motion that's really omnidirectional. Or is it really just, yeah, here, 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 here. This is with respect to gamma and binding only. And there may not be an answer to this question. I think, it, I think it's de it depends on the task, first off. I think, uh, and secondly, part of this is kind of unanswerable because of the current neuroimaging methods that we have, where on one hand we get high spatial resolution, and on the other hand we get high temporal resolution. So a lot of the methods that detect actual uh, oscillatory activity, which you can't really see in an fMRI. fMRI, you just get location, and then the EEG, you get act, uh, oscillatory activity. But when they're in an EEG, you get those things like I was saying, where it's kind of, uh, you know, for instance, they found frontal and parietal gamma activity in uh, co it, it co varies with compa increased compassion, right? Which is incredibly vague. So all frontal and parietal, which basically means the whole front of your brain and then the top of your brain. Yeah. And then if you look at these electrodes, they're just on the top of the skull, right? So you're just getting this, what you're getting is, I mean, we don't even know where in the brain that, that signal is coming from. It's coming from somewhere here, right? Each one is covering so many neurons. And then when you get fMRI, you get you know this super spatially um, very good, like spatial resolution. And so it's, it's actually hard to see both at one time and people are combining them, but it's still kind of vague. And then those ones I was talking to you about where you get like this real time sort of visualized, uh, you can see the bouncing, right? They're very rare. So, uh, I'm, I, I, actually, yeah. I, I mean, I think that'll be, that'll be, you know, exciting when, when they come out with, Things where we can really more see a lot of this stuff in real time and and how these these processes are occurring you know in great detail both um, temporally and spatially at the same time as of right now it's it's much more foggy right like the eed yeah. is kind of like all right we stuck an electrode here and then it picked up a signal but where that thing came from who knows i mean somewhere near here <laughs> Yeah, that's so, the issue. So, so thus, you know, my my sort of vague general ideas that stem from vague general. I mean, not to say this stuff isn't miraculous. It is. It's it's wonderful, and I never want to put down you know the amazing research that's being done. And I, you know, it's it's incredible. I just as I'm trying to interpret it, I'm noticing sometimes it's hard to interpret because we're in the beginning stages of I think figuring all this out. Yeah, okay. So like I say, you just go over it and over it and over it until you get some sort of insight. Mm -hmm. So here's what we know. Um, there's some sort of predictable spatio-temporal pattern. It's the same thing that happens over and over again. So what does that mean? Well, That could mean that one region is over and over again sending out a signal. Uh, we'll say that that signal terminates in several regions throughout the brain. So if we were talking about one neuron, we'd be talking about the fan out of the axon, whatever it goes to. But we can think of that as not being one neuron firing in a pattern that has axons, which are probably not too far away unless if it's in the brain, uh, you know, if, if it's going down into your foot, that's something else. But uh, the axons are doing what they're doing in the gray matter. Um, so this system fires and we get ba bang, 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 ba bang. What that might mean is that 
each of those things that we observe represents that system, that end neuron, uh, that, yeah, the, those endings, whatever they are, they're setting off local activity in a spatial temporal pattern. So this guy or this system is going bang, bang, bang here. And when it goes bang, then so many milliseconds later, this and this go bang. So many milliseconds later, this and this and this other thing go bang. And then, and then the interneurons uh, quench that signal, right? Presumably that has to be erased right. for the next signal. Uh, how does it die away? What, what prevents it? it there, so if that were, if that's going, its job is to send this thing out, there's got to be something all around it that's gonna turn it off uh, in a way where it doesn't interfere with the next burst, right? So there's some, some sort of wiring is probably uh, sent ahead or figured out so that as soon as I do my thing, I'm also assured that it doesn't cause her whole brain to convulse. That's right. what I'm guessing. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that you say that because some of these very high synchrony states, um, the only real times they happen are orgasm, epilepsy, and I would assume these mystical experiences. There's, there seems to be a thing about our system where when it gets to a high threshold enough uh, amount of oscillatory activity, it either goes to, I'm having an orgasm, an epileptic seizure, or or I'm seeing God, but then, you know, if it doesn't go away, it, it is kind of a problem. Uh, so I don't know what the down regulation mechanisms are. This is a, again, since you really are taking me fully out of my depth in this podcast, but um, your colleague, Dr. Sanguinetti talks about this with, uh, that in fact, the fast, this sort of, well, you guys use visuals, uh, visual processing test to sort of test how, how fast someone can ostensibly move from one stimuli to the next being very important, right? That there's the activity and then there's the, and then there's the, uh, how fast it can die down and a new one can emerge seems to be very important as well. In, that's right. In, uh, and that's something I don't totally understand, but I understand that it's important. Um, well, now I want to go back to something, and I know we're running out of time. Maybe we will have to take over Steve's program <laughs> or just continue ex parte. Um, but um, orgasm. Yeah, actually, this, this scene. Uh, what, what was the other one? Um, epilepsy. Epilepsy. And trance states, uh, flow states. So this is actually what got me thinking about this. If you want to know the truth, I was reading an article by Adam Saffron, and I was talking to my friend Barry Kamizaru, who's a sex researcher. He was talking about the similarities between epilepsy and orgasm, and then from there, the similarities between orgasm and mystical states of consciousness. So this high, uh, high synchrony, high oscillatory uh, state does seem to sort of it. It, 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 uh, what can I say? Sometimes I look at this stuff and it sort of feels like, oh, okay, you know, that is, is likely what people are experiencing in mystical ecstasy is, it's likely that it looks like that. There's a lot of people that are kind of reporting similar states of consciousness that seem to co vary with that sort of activity. Okay. This is a huge conversation. Yes, huge. I it's agree. an area that I have been thinking a lot about, and it's interesting that you bring it up. Orgasm, epilepsy. I'm going to also put um, extreme pain. Mm. When a person, is, it's sort of, ghoulish to watch, but there's like videos of 
people like having their leg bit off by a shark or shit like that. I mean, you know, with a home camera and you see what it looks like till they get them to the hospital. Uh, you know, it's just like, what, what's that gonna be like? Someone just cut off your leg and you have no anesthetics. And from what I've seen, similar this body. kind of thing. Yeah. yeah, this kind of thing. It's what it looks like. Mm -hmm. um, looks a little bit like epilepsy, looks a little bit like orgasm. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing. I, with my own eyes, have seen someone sit down, lock themselves into full lotus, and then get up 12 hours later, go take a pee, come back, do the same thing again, and again, and again, all day, all night. My own eyes, okay. So an, or an ordinary person, someone I know, someone I lived with as in a monastery, didn't have a bed. That was it. No bed for him. I tried to keep up with him. I could, I mean, I would just be asleep on the floor every morning. He'd just be sitting there all night, all day, unless someone came to the temple and needed help. In which case, of course, I'm there to help. The, he was a Soto Zen uh, Roshi. And his interpretation of just sit is that, sit 24 seven in perfect lotus, unless there's something to do, in which case be of service, of course, don't be all attached to practice. Otherwise just sit. And he actually lived that. And I can tell you this is done with a smile on the face. I can also tell you that you have to break through convulsive pain with ease in order to do that. So they had to go through a stage where they would have lost control of their body because of the pain. They're convulsing. And then what happens is, you, I don't know how to, this is very hard to describe to someone. You stop physically convulsing, but you still internally convulse. That's how you're processing the pain. It still feels like you're passing out and you're doing this, but you're perfectly still, but your whole central nervous system is in a convulsion, but you have a smile on your face because there's such diminished suffering. And um, industrial strength practice takes you to that place. Um, and life can take you to that place. What I'm interested in is it is probably, or what it occurs to me is it is probably not a coincidence that orgasm, epilepsy, extreme pain, and the kind of states that advanced meditators enter and they look very tranquil, but inside it feels to me like I'm having a convulsion, but it's completely controlled. It's completely ordered. The information flow is exactly what it needs to be. And you're even sort of comfortable, even though it's also sort of awful. Um, and this is when my, one of my teachers said, eventually you're gonna just sit there and you'll be able to sit there and not get up, sit there for three days, not move. And I'm going, yeah, sure. Um, but then he said, you'll work your way up to it. Because I was, there's no way I'm going to sit there for three. 
He said, you, a person works their way up. And now I see what he means. And it takes a very long time, at least in my experience, but you can work your way up to that. Um, but the thing is, I think that there's a natural response here that we could access and give people the ability to do what that Soto master does, which is a kind of convulsion, although you would never think it. But I can tell you, I, I, from my own experience, you have to get over that hump to do that kind of sitting. So if this is a natural process and happens all over, um, then maybe we can figure out a way to bring early meditators to that. Right, I mean, then the question becomes, which we're, we're now getting into practical applications here. If, well, I would imagine that the, the question would then become, you know, if that was possible, then how do you teach these people to relate to that experience? Because it seems that relating, as you said, relating to this extreme convulsive intensity, whether pleasurable or painful, requires substantial equanimity of some variety that I can barely imagine. Uh, so if you took yeah. a person without equanimity and expose them to that type of state of consciousness, how would they deal with that would become my, well, what, my what, question what, what, after that. Well, there's two, there's two questions. Right. One is you don't take them to that unless you can induce equanimity. And we're hoping that the ultrasound does just that. Right. Um, but the other one is the issue of integration. Even if they have equanimity, even if this is a blissful experience for them, it takes an enormous amount of systematic training to integrate these esoteric states into the practicalities of human life. And we, meaning professional mindfulness teachers, we know how to do that. That's what we do. We don't just give you some esoteric state. We, how does this relate to your relationship with your family? How does it relate to your relationship with food? How does it relate to uh, your understanding of US politics? What have you? We're going to bring it into the practical. Um, and of course, the, the devil is in the details there because, you, you know, however, it's in my manuals. Uh, there's all the algorithms for integrating these esoteric states um, are there, documented. Johnny, I call it, after the song, jo the Johnny Mercer song. Uh, accentuate the positive, eliminate the negative, latch on to the affirmative, don't mess with Mr. In Between. I interpret those four as a basic algorithm for integrating emptiness into the practicalities of humanity. Uh, but you are absolutely right. It's one thing to bring a person to an esoteric state. It's a very, very different thing to have that be integrated into something that is um, for humanly fulfilling and humanly effic uh, effective in the world, efficacious in the world. Uh, that's, that's a whole other question. But I think we've, we've had a good conversation. Oh yeah. my God. Zen. Yes, you took me took me to places I definitely didn't anticipate. This integration thing is extremely interesting to me. We could talk more about that, and also this this inquiry and a lot of the questions you brought up are are uh, are open questions for me as well, which I hope to explore further. Great. Do you know? Um, do you know? Um, um, 
Willoughby Britton's work? I've heard <clears> her. Will. I've heard of her. I've read some of her work. Um, uh, as far as I know, she mostly works with a lot of the the sort of quote unquote negative outcomes. That's that's correct. Which, uh, which, which these are integration issues. What she works with is when the integration doesn't work out. That. Yes, and I mean, you would know far more about this than I, uh, but what I have observed thus far and my novice opinion after you know, looking at various spiritual communities is that it, it seems to me that there is actually more access to uh, various altered states of consciousness out there than there is really good advice on how to integrate them and how to uh, uh, yeah. uh, basically good, humble individual who is, is uh, you know, who uses this stuff to help themselves and others and live a better life rather than uh, to scaffold a new sense of, you know, egoic identity or what, what other, you know, things you could do with that experience. There's a lot of them, what, what you do afterwards and how do you think about it and how do you relate to it? What does it mean for you? And for all of those things you just mentioned, and it seems that that, that part is so necessary and I see so little of it being done well. And, um, Steve has actually helped me personally a lot with that stuff and is incredible, um, in my opinion, at, at, at guiding a person through figuring out how to live with a new brain. <laughs> okay. Steve, thanks so much. Oh, my pleasure. Uh I think uh, it looks like this coup is going to continue and become a, a, a part four at the very least, if you're up for it. You know what? You know what would be really crazy? Oh my God. That's going to just keep embarrassing me publicly. That's what I'm starting to feel like is happening. I come onto the podcast with some great ideas. I write these huge outlines about all this stuff I think is just so interesting and so amazing. And then Shinjin just takes me on this huge detour over to the left that I just have no preparation for. And he did it in my science meeting too. I thought I was going towards science and he started interviewing me about my meditation practice in front of my professor. I just went with it. I was like, okay, it's Shinsen. Shinsen knows best. I don't know. I don't know knows best. <laughs> just, but Shinsen does tend to do these things. Yes, that's true. But no, I was thinking if we wanted to pursue the binding, um, we could have Jay on, oh. the three of us, because he knows, he knows, knows, knows. And we're asking the questions, but I bet it would be interesting to hear what he has to say. I mean, I was um, just- I was Just just, just, say, just thinking, you know. Yeah. This Great. whole call, I was like, where is Jay? I need Jay. <laughs> I don't know any- Me too, me too. Oh. It's like, <laughs> he the man. <laughs> I, let, let's do it. That sounds great. Binding, binding well, with Jay, and and also I think it would be very interesting to continue the discussion of integration of these uh, these yeah, uh, alter states. Right. Jay knows about uh, gamma binding, and I know about integration. <laughs> yes. Uh, Talked about integration with Jay as well, because it's we we have we have thought in in some of our conversations that it may be a. a part of this top-down processing actually that the way that we think about our experiences and the way that we understand and comprehend and integrate them it's almost like top-down gets disrupted and then how do we reorder it in a new fashion and that's sort of what integration is is this reordering of top-down processing anyway so i'm saying i've talked about this a lot with jay as well um but all these topics and and he's you know far more knowledgeable than than me well, great. Let's let's do an episode of about integration and another episode with Jay, uh, the, <laughs> the, the two of you and Jay together. I think that would be fabulous if you're up for it. What do you think, guys? Uh, I'm up for anything. This is this is on Jay's schedule. He's getting busier and busier. So um, we'll see what he has to say. Okay, sounds uh, good. Well, Shinzen well, Young, Shinzen Young, and Chelsea Fasano, thank you very much. Okay. Good stuff. Thank you. Thank you for listening to another Guru Viking podcast. For more interviews like these, as well as articles, videos, and guided meditations, visit www.guruviking.com.